This video is about debugging electronics. It corresponds to sections 13.2 through 13.4 of applied analog electronics. Now, in a previous video, I talked about generically how one does debugging in any sort of engineering problem. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk more specifically about domain-specific debugging techniques that apply to electronics. The first thing that I do whenever a student asks me for help in the lab usually is show me your schematic. Because one of the general debugging problems is trying to figure out whether a problem is in the design, and so even if the thing's built the way the design says, it's not going to work, or whether the problem's in the implementation. The design is perfectly okay, but the implementation doesn't match the design. So in order to figure out that, in order to try and narrow down where the problem might be, I have to be able to see the design. And for you to be able to figure out where the problem is, you have to be able to see the design. So you have to have a clean schematic before you do your building. If your schematic is no longer up to date, if you're saying, well, I changed this and I changed this and I've got a whole bunch of changes in my head, well, I can't see inside your head. I can't help you debug until you have a clean schematic that shows me what it is you're trying to implement. So first thing is have a clean schematic. Some things you can do to make it easier to debug. One thing is that you can label your schematic so that every pin on your chips has a pin number, and that pin number is written on the schematic. For instance, we're often using a quad op amp chip, which has got four different op amps in a single package. Well, if I've got a picture like this one behind me, which positive input? There's four of them on the chip. Which negative input? There's four of them on the chip. Which output? There's four of them on the chip also. So if you label them, then it's much easier for somebody to say, okay, this is pin 14, let's st stick an oscilloscope on there, doing the right thing. Uh, this is pin uh, 7, let's stick an oscilloscope on there. Oh, that's not doing what we expect, is it? Um, but if it's going, if the person trying to help you has to keep going, which op amps this one? Which op amps this one? Which op, op, op amps this one? It's harder to do that sort of debugging. So it's nice to put pin numbers on your schematic, checks to make sure that things are the way you expect them to be. You know where they are on the board. Okay, now let's take a look at a breadboard and let's see what sort of problems actually come up in lab. Alright, so this is a breadboard that's not very complete. I just picked it uh, to illustrate some of the problems that I sometimes see from student labs. First thing that every call center is taught to ask people when they call in with a computer problem or appliance problem of almost any sort these days is, is it plugged in? And the answer here is immediately, no. There's no USB cable here. If there's no USB cable, there's no power. Circuit cannot possibly work without power. You'd be surprised at how many times students have call called me over to help and I said, uh, where's your USB cable? Oops. Easy check. Do those easy checks. You'll feel better about it if you go, oh, no USB cable, I'll fix that. And then, does it work? Well, maybe, maybe not. If it still doesn't work, there's still the question of, is there power? Because just because you've got power to the chip here doesn't mean the power is getting out to this chip over here, which is the one that you're trying to build your circuit around. So here's some things to check. From the Teensy board, we have got the second pin here is ground and the third pin is 3.3 volts. The ground wire, black wire that goes over to the blue wire here. So we've got ground connected here. Red wire goes from 3.3 volts out to the red, red column that runs here. Red wire is connected. We've got power and ground to there. Now we've got ground going to the middle pin, I guess that's pin 11 on this chip. And if you look on the data sheet for the op amps we're dealing with, that is indeed where ground is supposed to go. Ground is hooked up correctly. Notice P 
pin one is over in this corner. If you put the chip in the wrong way around, which is a common problem, uh, you'll let the magic smoke out of the chip and it'll stop working because these op amps really do not like having power and ground reversed. They get a large current through them, they get too hot, and they stop working. Okay, the 3.3 volts is supposed to be here on pin four, and there, it's on pin four. Everything looks great. Uh, nope. Look at this row here, that red row there. It's only got one wire in it. There's no 3.3 volts there. It's just a floating wire. We need to connect up the 3.3 volts that we hooked up to where we wanted to use the 3.3 volts. We need an extra wire there. Doing that power check that I just did would catch something like 15 to 20 percent of the requests for help that I get in the lab. USB cable there is the power there all the way to the chip. You can do that. You can do that yourself. So this is the first bit of domain knowledge for electronics. Is it turned on? Is there power? And um, if you're still a little uncertain about that, you can take a voltmeter and touch one probe to pin 11, one pin, probe to pin 4. Is there power actually all the way to the chip? Because sometimes one of these wires is too short. Here they're long enough. They're long enough to go into the breadboard almost down to the bottom. Um, sometimes they're a little too short and only touch the plastic here, like that, and not all the way down to the metal contacts. So checking from pin to pin on the chip to make sure that it's got power is a further check that you can do. That one's a little more subtle most of the time the problem is just you know something like leaving out this wire or leaving out one of these wires but it's an easy check so check that you've got power and the power is to the correct pins of the chip and different chips need power and ground in different places so don't just assume well it was right on this chip this other different type of chip it may have the power and ground needs in different places so check that on your data sheet okay once you've got power and ground working what else can you check? And there's several checks that I do after that. One check that I do is comparison with a schematic. Now I don't have a schematic in front of me for this one, so I can't do a detailed check, but there's certain sanity checks that I can make. Um, for example, if this is an, uh, an op amp being used in a negative feedback op amp, well, we have Quite often, uh, you'll see it on class t-shirts. So that's a, that's a circuit that you should have when you're actually building these things burned into your head. Um, and so you can do some sanity checks on that. You can say, okay, if I'm looking at the output of the op amp, what's the output of the op amp? No, well, that's the pin here on the end, pin 14. What should be connected to that? Well, the output port should be connected to that. And it should be connected over pin A0 here. It is. Great. That's connection correct. What else? There should be a feedback resistor from there to the negative input. Oh, huh. negative input is the next pin over. There's a connection there. Great. We're done. Um, other sanity check. What we expect to see on the T-shirt here is that the negative input is in the middle of a voltage divider. So we expect to see another connection to the negative input. And you know, the blue wire here, if it's going out to a resistor or something out here, which currently it isn't, so we've got a problem there. We haven't got this thing fully built. But if that was going out to a resistor, we'd say, okay, that could be the other input of that. And in fact, there's sometimes when that won't go to another resistor, we have some things like trans impedance amplifiers where it'll be connected to something different. So you do have to have your schematic here. This is possibly a trans impedance amplifier, and this is where it's coming in from, from a sensor. Um, so not immediately obvious whether there's a problem here or not. I'd need to look at the schematic. But I can see, without looking even at a schematic, there's another problem here. Because 
look at row 39 on the breadboard here, which would be pin 12. Between the ground pin and the negative input is the positive input. There's nothing connected there. Zero wires. Unconnected input is definitely a problem. Whether we're doing a negative feedback amplifier, it's a transipedance amplifier, or an inverting amplifier, or non-inverting amplifier, anything we're doing, we need to have an input. To the positive, we need to have a couple things hooked up to the negative. So immediately this says there is a wiring mistake here. This cannot match any reasonable schematic. And that's a little piece of domain knowledge that's again fairly easy to apply that I've just given you. Every input on an amp amp needs to be connected. The positive generally has one connection, the negative generally has two connections. If you don't have that, something is wrong. Again, this is something you can check yourself. These sorts of simple sanity checks are really worth doing, going through your breadboard, checking this stuff before you ask for help. Because the point of this debugging in lab is for you to learn how to debug. And so trying the steps yourself is the first thing to do. Once you get to the point where all right, you did all the, th the obvious things, you've done all the sanity checks, and it's still not working, then call for help, and somebody with more expertise in debugging can help try and figure out, is it a design problem, is it an implementation problem, is there something more subtle going on? And you know, that's why people are here to help, but try the simple things yourself first. Okay, some things that'll help both with your own debugging and with getting help from other people on your debugging. One I mentioned already was having a neat schematic and having pin numbers on the schematic. Another thing that's useful is to color code your wires. I will not look at a schematic in which the red is anything other than 3.3 volts, the black is anything other than ground. The red will be the highest voltage power supply. Sometimes we'll be working with a 5 volt power supply rather than a 3.3 volt power supply. Whichever it is, red is that power supply, black is ground. Don't use those color wires for anything else and always use those colors for those uh, power supply signals. Otherwise it's too difficult for somebody else looking at your design to go Wait a minute, there's a red wire here. Why are you putting power to that? Oh, you're not putting power to that. You've used red for something else. Too confusing. Um, so that's the first part of the color coding is red and black are reserved. The other thing is when you've got multiple wires on the same node, I've got this, this thing is connected to here, 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 and here. Use the same color wire for that node. If I've got five wires connected together, they should all be the same color. That helps me f debug because if I say, hey, I've got a blue and a yellow wire here in the same row, there's an error. Those two things aren't supposed to be connected, and yet they are. One of them maybe missed a hole. Maybe it's supposed to be over one row from where it is. Try and figure it out. But if you've got just sort of, oh, I've randomly picked colors of wires just sort of randomly. Anytime I needed a new wire, I just picked a different color. It's going to be hard to debug because this, oh, this blue wire is reverf. No, now this yellow wire is reverf. No, this green wire is VREF. What the hell? I can't follow what's going on. Particularly if the wiring is as sloppy and messy as this one is. That's way too long a wire, way too messy. Uh, it's really hard to track wires when they get all tangled together. Keep your wires short, point to point. Make it so that it's very easy to follow the wire from one end to the other and it doesn't, you know go into a rat's nest. When you've got two different nodes that are close together, like here I've got this node and this node. Right now they're on adjacent pins of the chip. Make them different colors. That way if I'm off by one, I can see, oh, 
I got a blue and a white wire there in the same row. Something's wrong. I don't have to sit there and go, oh, I wonder if that's connected or not. Where does this one go? Where does this one go? I can immediately see something's wrong. One of those is in the wrong place. I might have to take a look and say, okay, this one is the output node and it's supposed to go over to here. Oh, this one was supposed to be for transient beans amplifier going to the negative input. I missed the hole and was off by one. If you color code the wires so that adjacent pins are always different colors, you will catch probably a third of the wiring mistakes that get seen in the lab. And to help you with that, you can color code your schematic. You can sit there and say, oh, the output node here, we'll make that one white. Ah, oh, the negative input node, we'll make that one blue. Ah, oh, the positive input node, we'll make that one green. And there's no green wire here, so there's something wrong. Positive input missing. And if I've stuck the green wire in the same row as the blue wire, I go, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. They're not the right colors. They're supposed to be the same color on the same node. They're maybe not supposed to be the same node. Fix the wiring. So color coding your wires takes a little longer to do your wiring because you have to sit there and go, oh, not only do I need a wire, but I need a green wire of this length. It'll take you some extra minutes to do your wiring. It'll save you hours in the debugging, though. So take the time to do a neat job of your wiring. Take your time to color code correctly. If things are too messy, particularly if we're having to do this thing via Zoom or video links, it's going to be really hard for me to see what's going on if it's just a rat's nest. Okay, so the color coding rules again. Black wire for ground. Nothing else is black. Ground is always black. Uh, red wire for your positive su power supply. Don't use the red wires for anything else. Um, all the nodes, all the wires for a single node must be the same color. And wires for adjacent rows on the breadboard or PC board, if they're not, unless they're part of the same node, should be different colors. Okay, so other good breadboard practices. Um, as I said, short point-to-point -point wiring. If you're going to put in resistors, there's two ways to do it. Either this flying resistor design where it's going into adjacent holes, or slightly better in many cases is to lay it flush against the board and have like um, some skipped holes between the two ends. Don't have long bare wires. So that's the problem with this uh, flying resistor design is that there's one long bare wire there. If you're going to have a couple flying resistors next to each other, they better, their long bare wires better be the same node because long bare wires have big possibility of touching and short circuiting. So when you're stripping your wires, the wires should be stripped to just a little bit shorter than the depth of the breadboard because you want it to go all the way in so it makes contact, but not leaving any wire sticking out. So too short, and you might just touch the plastic and not touch the metal underneath, not making good contact. Um, and too long, and well, either you can have it coil up underneath and short to the thing next to it, or you can have wire sticking out the top and short circuiting up there. So strip wires to the right length, um, what else? If you've got orientable components like diodes, phototransistors, microphones, uh, make sure they're oriented the right way. This is probably another 20% of the errors that I help people debug in the class is they put the chip, they put the chip or the component in the wrong way around. Check that. Particularly important on things like the, um, op-amp chips, because you put these op-amp chips in the wrong way around, they get hot and stop working. And you have to throw them away and replace them. So be very careful about getting them the right way around, because swapping power and ground on them is a really bad thing. Um, when you're checking your schematic against your circuit, count the number of things that are connected to each node. Here I 
counted, there were supposed to be two things on the output, a resistor and an output port. They're both there. I counted the things on this input. There's supposed to be two things there, a resistor and an input from somewhere else. They're both there. I counted the things on the positive thing. There's supposed to be one thing there. It's not there. There's a problem. So just counting the number of things is a good check for consistency between your schematic and your breadboard. It's not sufficient. I mean, sort of a necessary quick check. But then you should check other things like, is this resistor the right value? Quite often, people misread a value and they put in a 1 ohm resistor or when they want a 1, one, one kilo ohm resistor. Or, and that generally doesn't allow the circuit to work. So checking the color code or taking the resistor out and measuring it with an ohm meter, those can be useful checks to do. Um, do check sometimes if you've got something that you think is not making connection or if the you know signal looks fine here and doesn't look fine on the other side sometimes it's a wire that's not making good connection um, and you can check for connectivity with, uh, with your own meter or there's actually the uh, diode setting on the ohm meter that uh, will make a little beep if things are connected uh, those connectivity checks are sometimes worth doing particularly if you've got an old breadboard that's kind of worn doesn't always make good contact. Okay, those are probably enough sort of basic sanity checks to make on your breadboard. Basically, once you've got all the simple sanity checks done, just check everything against your schematic. A lot of the problems that we see in lab, a lot of times the debugging help is just miswiring off by one on one of the one of the wires something like that if you can check that yourself before asking for help it'll save a lot of time